My neighbor's wife was a werewolf. Dear Scary Stories NYC One time I went over to my former neighbor's house to knock on the window and return something to him that I had borrowed. But before I could even get within five feet of his house, I glanced through the window and saw his newlywed wife transform before my eyes into a hideous, drooling, half-dog, half-woman kind of werewolf monster. Even though this happened over 15 years ago, I'm afraid of her finding me and my wife, who has been quite ill of late. For that reason, I'm going to tell the story anonymously and leave out locations. It did happen in western Pennsylvania, though, I will admit that much. So, my wife and I had bought our house in the later 1980s, and already living next door before we moved there was a friendly gentleman we'll call Bill. Bill and I got along and would chat about current events, but I never learned very much about him personally, which is probably for the best. I didn't know the way he voted, I wasn't sure about his religious faith, and although we regularly attended each other's yard parties and got to know some of each other's closer friends, I don't remember ever being inside his house, and I think he was only inside mine once or twice max. Maybe part of the reason we got along so well was that we had clear and sharp boundaries. Good fences make good neighbors, as the poet Frost famously wrote. My wife and I were in our mid-fifties when this all happened, and I think Bill was five or six years older than us. He might have been a little over sixty, I guess. So after all those years of living next to Bachelor Bill, we were quite surprised one day to be introduced out on the sidewalk to a lovely Eastern European woman that we can call Helga. She was apparently Bill's new wife. He called her his new pen pal wife and said that they had been writing back and forth for years in private. Finally, he paid for her to come to America from her homeland, somewhere across the sea, and be his wife. Helga was polite to me and my wife, and she seemed like a nice person at first. In those days, I was still working an office job, and my wife was helping her friend's business out, which meant a couple of days in the friend's office, and then three half days of work that she did from home. So, one of the days my wife was working from home, she heard a big fight erupt next door, and it was a loud one. She did an imitation of it for me, and it was Helga screaming, and Bill whining and begging and pleading, and then more of Big Helga laying down the law in a pretty unkind fashion. I was stunned to be informed of this that night, and to be honest, I didn't really believe it. I'm sorry to say that I assumed my wife was just being jealous of the younger and more mysterious lady from overseas. I figured she was making up or exaggerating the story about Helga being mean to her husband. She seemed perfectly nice to me, I bought my wife some roses and took her out to dinner and dancing as a surprise, hoping that might make her less jealous and more secure. To my surprise, the stories of Helga bossing old Bill around continued, though, and when I heard a similar bit of gossip coming from the neighbor on the other side of Bill's house, I wondered if my wife had just been telling me the truth the entire time. I could have saved all that flour and dinner money if I had just taken her word at face value. But I'm still glad I played it the safe way. One day I wanted to return Bill's shears that I had been using to trim some shrubbery. And I walked across the driveway toward a window of his house that looked like it had some activity behind it. Bill and I had been knocking on each other's windows to talk since the 1980s. And this was maybe 2002 or 2003. So it was quite an ordinary thing for us. At least on the weekends. In good weather. I stopped short of walking all the way to the window when I glanced up and noticed Helga, Bill's wife, in the window. She was not looking out, though. She seemed to be wincing in pain. At first, I thought someone was striking her from behind, judging by her sharp and pained reactions. After some length, I could tell that something was happening to her that might be more likened to a seizure than anything else. She seemed to be having some sort of medical episode, and she also seemed to be in sharp pain. I took a step toward the window, wanting to help, but not sure how. Then, I thought about running back to my house and calling for an ambulance. 
I took an unsure step back in that direction. Then, I thought that I should probably go and get Bill. So I turned indecisively back toward his house, where something that no longer looked like Helga was gyrating and palpitating behind that window. This was when I saw a human being become a werewolf. It was quite unpleasant to observe, but seemed to be far more unpleasant to have to actually experience. It was both like they show it in the movies and not at the same time. The hair coming out physically from the body, I witnessed that. The nose on the face elongating into a dog snout? This is impossible and could never happen because human beings are not the Transformers. And yet, I also witnessed this happen with my own eyes. She grew larger and wider and furrier and each time she screamed an open-mouthed bellow of sheer agony, her teeth grew bigger and longer. She had zoomed past Barnabas Collins I was on her way to saber-toothed male bride when I heard my wife screaming at me to get the hell away from that window. She had seen it too, and she had already called the cops. When they arrived, they found Bill inside, unconscious but alive, and I saw them ship him out of there in an ambulance. I don't think the wife was inside when the cops were in there. I think I would have remembered if that happened. People ask me what a real-life werewolf looks like, or they used to when this was all fresh. First of all, she became much larger than she was in her human form during the transformation. She started off a lovely young woman wearing a light tan-colored turtleneck, and by the end of the transformation, she was a beast with thick fur all over. The only thing left of that turtleneck was the collar, which now resembled a dog collar in this new context. Now, I know this was a female werewolf, but once she had transformed, I honestly could not see anything feminine about her at all. I'm sure she had female private parts, but her bottom half was hidden from my view as I was looking into the window at her. Once the turtleneck tore, there was nothing sexy under there. There's a big hairy dog chest bursting out. People used to ask me if she was an upright werewolf like the howling or if she walked down on all fours like an American werewolf in London. In truth, as we'll get to in a moment, I did not see her walking. I only saw her transform, and even then I only witnessed her changing from the waist up. She did seem to remain standing upright on her hind legs through the transformation, if that helps to answer the question at all. So I think I already mentioned that she had an extended snout that I saw grow in front of my eyes. It was not, however, one of those super long snouts as you often show. It was something in between Lon Chaney Jr. and Dog Soldiers, maybe leaning a bit toward the Lon Chaney side. It was longer than a pug, but much shorter than a beagle. The fur was somewhere between red and brown, I guess. Brown with reddish highlights, so it sometimes looked kind of orange. Helga had blonde hair, so it was interesting that her werewolf self had this dark, reddish mane. I was mixed with pity for her painful, transformative torture, but also alert and alarmed that she had now become a creature with sharp fangs and long-looking nails on her savage-looking hands. She was not Helga anymore. She was the werewolf living next door. To quote something my wife said back then, it's not what you want to see. So I went to visit Bill in the hospital and his wife wasn't around. So I told him what I'd seen through his window. He got angry and started shouting. And then one of the nurses came with a large orderly and they escorted me out of the hospital. Bill threatened to sue me for slander if I was going to say ridiculous things about his wife being a wolf man, so I just stopped talking about it. And then Bill disappeared suddenly the day after getting back from the hospital, and from what I gleaned when the police were interrogating me, both husband and wife had gone missing. They searched our closets and our basement. I'm not even kidding. 
This was the kind of thing that never got out past our small set of gossipy neighbors, but it was sort of big news locally. People would stop and whisper when they would see us. It wasn't much fun. Eventually, we moved to a smaller and more expensive house, just because the neighbors there didn't know that I had once accused the lady next door of being a werewolf. But I saw her transform. Anybody would say what I said if they saw what I saw. My wife and I generally don't talk about this at all anymore. I'm only discussing it now because I'm telling it anonymously. I don't even know if I will reveal all the truth on my deathbed. I feel like she is still alive. The werewolf, I mean. And I also feel she's still paying attention to me. I don't know it to be true for a fact, but I somehow feel it deep in my bones. And if I cross her again, she'll take it out. Not on me, but on my children and my grandchildren. No, I've got too many loved ones I need to protect, so I'll never tell the full truth about any of this. But I will admit that, at one time, in one location, it was true that... My neighbor's wife was a werewolf. Don't go anywhere, we've got one more story starting right now. Did I have the strangest dogman experience ever? Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've got a really bizarre dogman experience to tell you about that happened to me back at the end of the spring or the beginning of the summer back in 1973. That was the most fun year to be alive ever. Both the Who and Led Zeppelin toured the U.S. Kojak was on TV, and gas was 39 cents a gallon. It was a warm night in the country, and I was cruising on Mount Airy Road, located in the middle of the woods. I had the windows all down, and I had the 8-track blasting out Mungo Jerry and Felix Cavalieri and other kinds of people that we'll sadly never hear the likes of again. It was a relaxing night, heading the long way home, and knowing that life was going to get better and better for me and the USA until we hit the year 2000 and we all got issued our own flying saucer cars like on the Jetsons. It's hard to underestimate how happy people used to be allowed to be back then. We thought we'd only gain freedoms and that we'd share them with the parts of the world darkened by the blight of dictatorship. We were the freedom bringers in our mind and the world would follow in our wake and so there was free speech in all locations, and dictators were tossed into the trash bin of history. Why, someday we thought we'd all be as free as Canada, lol. So yeah, I'm from the last generation stupid enough to think there was something good to look forward to. Now they call us boomers, but at least we had our fun when we still could. Hope all of you listening to this can say the same. I have my grandnephew here to remind me of what I was saying when I started to get off track. Dogman. We're discussing the dogman. I saw one of them once, and it might have been the strangest dogman story of all time. People have told me just that, using those exact words. So it's not like I'm the only one who feels this way. You tell me what you think about it. Imagine you're driving on a warm night through Mount Airy Road in the woods, and suddenly you see something on the road in front of you that makes you stop the car and turn off your favorite Mata Hoople track to stare ahead of you. That's what happened to me. There, in front of me and blocking parts of both lanes of the road, was a really, really, really big dog of some kind. In fact, maybe it was a wolf. It was nearly bear-sized, to be honest, and looked insane with its eyes reflecting back my headlights. It was just an extremely massive dog or wolf creature. I saw it down on all fours, and it was chowing down on, now get this, a very tall, four or five layer cake, like a wedding cake, I guess you might say, or a birthday cake for a very important person. It seemed to be for a lady as it was covered in pinkish icing, almost five feet tall, and seen by what was left of the bottom and sides of it 
to have been professionally created. I do not know how either the cake or the giant canine got to be where I was viewing them, but the fact that I was viewing them was beyond question. This was not my imagination, as strange as the scenario might have been. It was not a dream, but I was definitely awake at the time, since I was driving. The creature was eyeing me, and growling loud enough to be heard over my engine. And then it did the thing that made it something for me to write to you about so many years later. It reared back up on its hind legs, and it stood there, like a man. It didn't do it fast, either. It just slowly, slowly reared back in this menacing manner. It kind of reminded me of a cobra snake more than anything else. Soon it was up at its full height, nearly twice the size of the partially eaten cake in front of it. You know, when you're nine feet tall, you can have icing all over your snout and still look pretty damn intimidating, believe me. The beast took a step out from behind the cake, and I could see even through the thick fur that this was a beast with muscles on top of its muscles. I immediately got up and leaned over into my back seat, rolling the one window up and then the next one. My back ached, and I was out of breath before I turned around and saw that the beast had taken another step or two in my direction. This gave me the strength to lean over and roll up my passenger seat window. That only left my own driver's side window, and the dog-headed creature was trotting over to that. I started rolling it up, or I tried to, but he sort of casually jogged over and placed his hand-sized paw on the top of the glass, preventing me from rolling it up any further. The dogman seemed to be asking me to stop. So... I stopped, wondering what was going to happen next. Before I even knew what was happening, the dogman's head was inside my window, smelling my cheek, smelling my ear, snuffling into the back of my shirt. And finally, in the single most terrifying moment of my entire life, that creature snuffled my crotch as I sat there as still as I could behind the steering wheel. After what felt like 17 and a half years later, the dog was apparently satisfied, and he withdrew his bear-sized head from my window. Then he walked back over to his wedding cake and resumed eating. I looked down at myself and saw that I was now covered in pink cake icing, especially in the crotch area. I knew deep down I would be safe if I drove around the beast very slowly and didn't make any sudden moves. I knew the worst of it was over. I knew I'd better move on before the dogman changed his mind, too. But in spite of all these things that I knew, I sat there, instead, shaking all over, and kind of crying about it for a while. I don't understand why I cried. I mean, if the dogman had bitten into my pants instead of just sniffing... Then I might have had a reason to cry, you know. But that isn't what happened. It was fine. The dogman just got my clothes and hair filled with sugary pink goo. Then he went back to his own world. That's not something to weep about. I should have been happy and laughing that I was going to get out of there safe. And all of me was still connected to all the rest of me. I mean, it should have been the happiest moment of my life. But instead... I was all weepy and shaky. And when I eventually did drive super slow around that dogman and his dessert before making my getaway, I did it in a jumpy manner. Every time the big dog bit into his cake, I jumped. Every time he shook his head, I jumped again. I was acting stupidly, and my stupidity almost got me killed. That's what it almost did. So let that be a lesson to any of you that might be stuck in a weird situation with a dogman. Don't let fear beat you when the dogman is letting you get away. The dogman could have had me for dinner, 
but he had a sweet tooth, so he let me go. It was a moment to celebrate, and it's a memory to celebrate too. But at the same time, it was the most upsetting thing that happened to me that whole year. 1973, I mean. I still recommend it highly. If you ever have a chance to time travel back to 1973, don't let my dogman story scare you away, man. 73 was the best. After all, this was a super rare occurrence. When I think back on it, I still have to ask myself. Did I have the strangest dogman experience ever? And now it's time to speak very highly about our new EP named Christopher Nihis. It's all good and never a diss when we talk about our newest of all EPs named Chris. Please join me in thanking our newest executive producer, Chris Nihis, for making this episode possible. If you would like to become a channel member like Chris, then stay tuned for this entertaining and informative presentation by everybody's favorite 2D animated dogman, Henry Lee. Thank you. Thanks, Biggie, and thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button. Or join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascary. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after, I think, three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back, come back, come back. Scary, scary, scary story. story.